I'm uh, the New York Bureau Chief for The Economist, and it's my pleasure to um, oversee this next hour of our discussion about the, uh, the future of Europe. And we will see if we can muster as much optimism as been mustered about the future of America in the last panel. Um, we're going to kick off with uh, remarks, keynote remarks from uh, the new, well, re-elected last year as president of uh, Estonia, uh, President uh, Thomas Henrik Ilves. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know how much optimism you had in the last panel, uh, alas, uh, I was not here. But, uh, but just, just briefly, I would say that uh, it pays to know foreign languages. Because if you only read the English language press, be it the US or the uh, Eurosceptic British press, with the exception of The Economist, of course, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you get one view of Europe. Uh, which is, uh, especially during an election year here, gets, uh, allows even more Euro bashing. But, uh, but just to put things in perspective, uh, admitting that there are countries in, uh, in Europe that have uh, very serious problems, uh, that there are countries in Euro Europe with very <clears throat> in the Eurozone that have very serious issues, but if you actually look at the overall indebtedness of the Eurozone, it's 80% of GDP. I think a lot of countries, including the United States, would be very happy to have a t an indebtedness of 80% of GDP. The, uh, in the Eurozone uh, this year, the deficit is 4%. And next year, assuming we all do what we should be doing, and I have no reason to doubt that uh, countries will meet their targets, we will have a 3% overall deficit in the Eurozone. Now, if you look at that, that's not really bad. Um, that's, in fact, quite enviable from the perspective of a number of countries, including those that, that, uh, that own the Anglo press. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I mean, all the doom and gloom that I read, uh, uh, I think, is overdone. Now, clearly, there are serious problems in the, uh, in the area, and much of it comes from policies that were pursued over a long time. From, um, and what we see as a result of those policies, I would argue we're seeing the beginning of a fundamental reordering of Europe. Uh, from my perspective, uh, a very welcome one since uh, for 20 years, uh, we wogs from the eastern part of Europe were considered somehow more corrupt, uh, less uh, diligent. Uh, we work, we supposedly worked less. When in fact, if you look at what is uh, what has been going on for the past twenty years, I mean, who's doing who's doing well? Uh, the Baltic countries are following the rules and doing well. Uh, Bulgaria is following the rules and doing well. Uh, and more broadly, um, if you look at uh, the area, the region that is doing well, uh, it's actually around the Baltic Sea rim, plus a few more countries in the neighborhood. Okay, Bulgaria is a little outlier, but the Netherlands. Um, not all of the countries are in the Eurozone. Clearly, Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden, Denmark are not. But all of the countries around the rim, uh, uh, around the Baltic Sea, Germany, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, uh, and then going down to the Netherlands, they are doing well. Now that's, uh, I mean, that's something that, uh, I mean, we can speculate, speculate about the reasons for that. But nonetheless, um, they, they are all characterized by fiscal probity. The other important thing to note, which uh, I mean, part of the kind of standard lazy thinking um, narrative is that, oh, if we if countries reform, they will they will be uh, they will have unrest and populism will rise. Well, in fact, it's I mean the most recent counterexample was the uh, the elections in the Netherlands, where the populist left and the populist far right lost. In fact, who won? 
It were the centrist parties from the right, I mean, sort of the Republicans and the Democrats won, basically, and they're both pro-European parties. And if you look around, uh, if you look around, again, the Baltic Rim, um, it is, I think, interesting, if not really notable, that the countries that took the difficult decisions, that opted for cutting costs, that opted for fiscal, um, for fiscal responsibility, everywhere, the governments that opted for it were reelected. So, I mean, the Latvians, the, well, we'll see, Lithuanians have an, have an election coming up. But in Latvia, you had, you had a government that took really tough, tough measures, and it was reelected. In Estonia, same thing. The toughest, I mean, tough, tough measures, they get reelected. Finland, the, the, the current coalition is the pro European. Let's be fiscally responsible coalition. Sweden, Karl Bildt's uh, or Reinfeldt's party was reelected, in fact, having enacted again uh, a number of serious cuts. Denmark, well, it's hard to say. I mean, I mean, in the sense that, I mean, the people who won are also doing fiscal responsibility. They did have a change, but it wasn't really an issue. And the Netherlands now last week. So, in fact, the idea that we cannot reform or we cannot cut costs because the voters will eject us is not true, empirically false, basically. And so uh, I think we need to rethink some of the thinking. Uh, and I think the other, the, the bogeyman of, the, um, of populist demonstrations in the street, which has been used a lot, saying, oh, we're going to see a rise of fascism, blah, 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 that is complete nonsense because, in fact, uh, doing the right things gets you reelected because, in fact, people turn out to be smarter than many politicians or journalists think because they understand that times are tough, we have to do something, tighten our belts, and, um, and deal with the issues that we face. Um, and moreover, I would argue that some of the governments that warned about the rise of populism the themselves were guilty of the worst forms of populism by borrowing huge amounts of money in order to get reelected. And that's not exactly a good reason for borrowing money and taking your country into massive levels of debt and indebtedness. So, I mean, I'm pretty bullish, actually, on, on the future of Europe, uh, at least the part of Europe where, uh, where countries take their, take their uh, commitment seriously. Because what it amounts to is that if in the Eurozone and in more broadly in the European Union, you say, yes, I mean, we agree that we will keep a 3% deficit limit, we will keep to a 60% indebtedness limit. Uh, the, some countries took that seriously, other countries did not take that seriously, and in fact, it turns out that the 60% indebtedness, the 3% deficit actually makes kind of sense. In fact, it's not just an arbitrary number. And so those of us who kept to the rules are doing okay. Now, what that means for the, those that have not kept to the rules, that's difficult to say, especially because some of them are rather large and have large economies. And so uh, uh, here, uh, I'm not an expert, but I mean, if you're, if you're running over 100% uh, indebtedness of GDP, uh, things may not be so good. You may not be able to get, uh, be able to get the kinds of percentages that uh, are sustainable for or servicing your debt even. Now, on the other hand, I do think that uh, more broadly, the last couple of weeks have injected a good deal of hope into the region. Uh, Draghi's decision, though perhaps not liked by, um, liked by everyone, um, is, uh, I think it was the right step. I mean, it's easing some of the pressure. The, uh, when the Karlsruhe Supreme Court Constitutional Court in Germany said that the ESM uh, is a, an appropriate, uh, I mean, constitutional. Again, the election in the Netherlands has injected a new spirit of optimism and uh, over something we've needed for a long time. From our, from my, uh, from my parochial, uh, parochial perspective in Estonia, where we've been waiting for it for a long time, because frankly, uh, it's kind of tough to be in a country where your average salary is 10% lower than the minimum salary in Greece, where the retirement age is 15 years higher than in Greece, it's 65, not for, not 50, and the, uh, and the, 
pensions are three to four times smaller than in Greece. I'm not talking about Greece in particular, just that this is the, since that's on the public, uh, that's on the radar. And so we then ratify first EFSF to bail out Greece, then we ratify ESM to continue bailing out Greece, perhaps also, um, perhaps also Spain or Italy. And when you're in a position where you're poorer and you're helping bail out uh, richer, uh, richer countries, it's politically not easy to sustain that. Our parliament has done it twice. Public opinion is completely against doing the right thing. I mean, 75%, I mean, 75 of the parliament voted for EFSF, 73% voted for ESM. Uh, public polls, po opinion polls released after that, 75% of Estonians are categorically against any of these agreements. So, um, I mean, I would say that, that what the parliament did in my country showed political, uh, political leadership, uh, courage, but as we all know, we all have to be reelected except for me because I can't run for a third term, and, um, and so I can be even more courageous. Uh, it means that you have to, um, I mean, you have to take into, I mean, a democracy takes into account public opinion and has to deal with these things, which actually, so uh, I don't see how long we can sustain this in, um, uh, I mean, if we have to keep bailing out, I think we're going, some countries will reach a, uh, a limit. On the topic of democracy, I would just sort of, almost done with my remarks, I would just say that, uh, uh, I should also mention Germany here. Um, Germany is a democracy. It has been for ever since World War II with the constitution imposed on it by General Lucien Clay and since then it's been a very good democracy. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not an authoritarian regime. Um, which means, which is, I never understand all of the flack that's, uh, that's uh, given to Angela Merkel about why doesn't she do more. Uh, I mean, it's a parliamentary democracy. She will, I mean, she will lose office. I mean, it's not even, it's not as if like you even have a term, right? I mean, the, the coalition says, no, we're not going to do it. Um, the, par the Bundestag represents the German electorate. The Bundestag is barely willing to do the things that need to be done because they're so angry at what has happened in Southern Europe. And so when I see all these articles from financiers to, to US commentators that Merkel has to do something. Well, Merkel basically if were to do what everyone wants her to do would be out of a job uh, because the, the Bundestag is not willing to do it. And this is both on both sides of the aisle, as it were, both the SPD, the socialist, Socialist Party and the Conservative Party are against any more bailouts. So, I mean, let's let's keep in mind that Germany is a democracy and give cut Mrs. Merkel some slack on this uh, because, I mean, she <laughs> it's a democracy. So, uh, so in, in this regard, um, I would say that we all should sort of calm down a bit. Uh, understand that it's difficult to get through this, that publics in Northern Europe are not really happy about the bailouts anymore, uh, even in my own country. But on the other hand, um, from our perspective, even though the public is annoyed, it's a lot better to be in the European Union, it's a lot better to be in the Eurozone than not to be. Uh, we work very hard to, to, uh, to adopt the Euro precisely because with a small currency as we had, as, 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 as good as it was. I mean, there wasn't, a, there, uh, nonetheless, uh, we all know from all kinds of currency speculation, not to mention other issues, that, um, that if you're a small country with a small currency, uh, you really are uh, sort of, you're playing with fire. It's much easier to be in a solid currency like, the, with, like we have with the euro, and, um, and more broadly, for small countries like mine, and basically every country in Europe today is a small country, including Germany, which has, uh, we think of that in China today, there are about twice as many people with the average income of, of Germany uh, than there are people in Germany. Uh, even Germany is a small country. This is why for Europe to, uh, to, uh, to, su to succeed in the future, it needs to do it as Europe and all kinds of uh, vociferous tendencies to go it alone, I think are misguided, and I hope that our dear friends in the, in the, uh, in the UK 
will think long and hard about, about where, where their interests lie. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, do, I, do I have Q&A? Anything? No? Okay. Yeah.